And good morning, everyone. It's Jen Riga from Royal Roads University, a professor of communication and culture. And welcome to our webinar series on sport, leadership, and social change. This is the 15th episode, and it's a one on one interview with TIG leader. More on TIG in a little while. We always start by acknowledging and thanking the Lekwungen and Kasepsen people because we are operating on their unceded territories here at Royal Roads University. And I live on the same territory in my home office. Uh, it's very important that we always acknowledge our the, the gaps in our history, the uh, history that we ignored for so many centuries, really, and make sure that we try to make up for that before we move toward reconciliation. We at Royal Roads feel we have a very strong responsibility to acknowledge the truth before we try to foster social change of any kind. So this aligns very well with our model as well. And I spent a lot of time also on the Wasanich territory, going backwards in my skinny boat on Elk Lake out in, uh, in Saanich. This webinar series, as you know, if you've uh, participated in any of our episodes, is all about the power of sport and leadership in sport, but also through sport. What can sport facilitate and foster within society that is about human and social development? And we know there are so many initiatives and endeavors and organizations that leverage sport for change, for inclusion, for uh, development. Lots of different organizations have been spawned for these kinds of social initiatives. And we at Raw Roads also try to reflect these kinds of concepts like development and inclusion, education, sustainable, uh, sustainable practice for the environment and business and human beings, equity and human rights, health, uh, my favorite communication, fostering collaboration across the world and uh, aiming toward world peace. We have many partnerships at Railroads and a few that I am deeply involved in have to do with sport. We uh, have a very special uh, flexible admission process which acknowledges different kinds of learning. So yes, your academic background, but also your learning from your professional experience and that includes sport. So we are partnered with Game Plan as an education partner and I liaise with students who are interested in joining our learning community taking some of our programs and for many of them even while they're training they can be uh, learning working toward their masters or undergrad while they're while they're centralized even so it's a wonderful opportunity for athletes who are who are training to keep working on their education and of course that informs their practice on the field and off we're also working toward a grad certain sport leadership and partnered with uh, many other organizations that are uh, from the sport realm. This is part of a series, and today we'll be focusing actually on uh, an individual that I've met through this partnership with the CFL Players Association, where we've just begun working with the CFLPA on leadership development. And so we kicked it off with just a, a four week course and to see the interest it's offered um, by the Players Association, but we had others join in on that cohort as well. Great fun. And that will keep expanding into uh, four credit courses as well. So we'll keep working on that development. And today I welcome Tig Leader. I'll go into more detail about Tig uh, and I'll ask him to introduce himself, of course, through his own experiences and background. But the unique story that Tig brings to us and that I think is so cool because it's about, you know, learning from one sport and then bringing that to another sport, not just out into society, which we talk about often, you know, what did you learn through sport and how can you bring that to uh, help people in society and help others within your community and organizations. But Tig is actually making a transition from rugby into football and not just, not just uh, rugby, but Irish rugby and then uh, US league rugby and then now into the CFL, which is really cool. So we're going to welcome him into Hamilton soon. He's in Boston right now, and Ty joins me right now. We're going to just have a great little conversation. So welcome. <laughs> How are you? Hey, yeah, very good. Cheers. Uh, thank you very much. Looking forward to chatting. Super. So I always ask everybody who joins me on this webinar series to talk a little bit about sport, what sport means to you, why sport, what drew you to it as a kid or as a, you know, a teenager or an adult, and then why do you think you're still so devoted to it? Because clearly you have, I know you've devoted a lot of your life to sport. So what is it about sport that you love? Um, 
uh, I, I guess they just the like, connection aspect of it. Um, for me, fortunately, it's it's taken me all over the world. Um, a lot of my friend groups, uh, uh, most of my male friends actually have gotten through sports. Uh, so like, yeah, connection. I think that, that that's probably been the biggest, the biggest thing for me. Whether growing up, I have two brothers were all within five years. So like for us, that was a way to connect. And then like as we progressed through through kind of ranks, I guess, in, in age, you know, a large part of our parents' life was around or sport and coming to sporting events and then our friends. And so, yeah, I guess I, alongside um, just loving the, the game or whatever sport it was that I was playing, I guess it was a way for me to just meet, meet, meet people um, and kind of common ground. Uh, yeah, that's, that's probably what I say to that. So fun. The people you meet, the friends you make. I think I felt the same way. Um, tell us a bit about your family, because I know they are all involved in sport. And so what does that say, right, about fostering the love for sport within the, the family home? Yeah, it, yeah, it's huge. Like my both my parents are heavily involved in rowing. So from from when I can remember when I was born, I guess like rowing was a part um of their what they were doing quite a lot and then you know I was just on the on the edges of the river watching or kind of got to grow up in the water a little bit because of that um that's mom and dad but then my dad was a highly accomplished rugby player and then as a result you know there's three three boys myself my other younger brother Dara both fortunately got to play professional rugby for the guts of eight years both of us did around eight years and then he unfortunately retired last year through injury and I have moved to a new sport um and then you know, my other brother was was quite a big rugby player as well. But yeah, for, for us, like um, it was a huge part, a huge part of rugby. Like, uh, well, in, even if it wasn't to do with rugby or rowing, we could be hiking or usually doing something quite active. Um, so yeah, it, it was again going back to whether it was something competitive or even just like a family outing. Usually, sport was something. That was part of it or something active and again having three boys all within five years was you know we were quite happy just to be cycling bikes climbing mountains or chasing whatever shape ball it was um so yeah that definitely helped and then our pets the pets and things like that and they were always quite you no know, they could partake in a lot of those things as well so yeah again that kind of whole family element it was really re really big for us and still is to this day yeah, and for your parents what what did you kind of glean from them you know what did they love about sport what were they what were they working for in sport? Because they ended up in roles of leadership, both of them too. So what do you think they were upholding there? Why do they care so much? Well, it stuck out a lot to me and something I'm now more aware than ever was just the amount they, I, and at that time as well, it was pure volunteer volunteerism. They were just like helping out, whether it's to help us kind of teams we were involved in, or a lot of times we ended up kind of going into the bigger scale in terms of the, the club or the programs almost from like a like you know management level or higher level stuff um but that's like and again they were volunteer roles um they they just loved i guess growing and rowing maybe a little bit not the most common sport in ireland it's big for sure but you know um uh, maybe just like growing that um but i guess just the willingness always to help and it was even in sports like Gaelic like football is a sport in ireland that they weren't necessarily had played and knew a whole lot about but whether it's just picking up players dropping them off uh, certain players their parents might have had the ability to kind of go to games you know they would be kind of helping out and taking care of all those things or um just like re really i guess basic things but unless someone does it the whole system doesn't work so i guess just the willingness to help out and um they just be really good people about it um and it, for me my, my brothers and i they were also taxis like as they say themselves they were taxis just driving us all over ireland um for for lots of 10 years so Hopefully it paid off in some regard for them. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I, I feel the same way, really devoted to sport. And as parents, uh, we actually were part of a group of parents that all had sort of specialized in certain sports. So, you know, growing up varsity or national team or whatever in these different sports. So we would each kind of take the group of kids and coach them in that sport and then hand them off to the next set of parents. And it was fabulous. But I think about why is it so important you know, those kids who couldn't get to the game and you step in and help is because you knew they were going to build confidence and, and friends and just be involved in something that's healthy and fun, right? Yeah, set them on the right path. Right on. And how about your background 
tell us about, you know, how you found your way into rugby and what attracted you, you to, to that sport in particular? Yeah, um, as mentioned, dad was quite heavily involved in the sport and then was coaching. So for me, from the eight, I think we started like six. Um, I started playing rugby. Like I, I remember my, my brothers, uh, again, we're fortunate, we're quite close in age, um, that we would just be, if it was raining outside, which unfortunately it often is, uh, in Ireland, we would just be in like the kind of living room hall area, just playing games, but like on our knees, so we'd be tackling each other. So we couldn't run, obviously, but like just catching the ball, throwing around, passing, like that was there from day one. Day one um, was rugby, amongst many sports, but rugby was probably the, the primary. Um, and then, yeah, just, I'll go back to the f fortunate that I could, I, like, you know, we, we would go training, whatever, once or twice a week at that age, but then we'd always be doing extra at home. And it wasn't seen as extra, it was just seen as fun, I guess. It's, that's a better way to describe that. It was just fun, so we were always playing. And then as a result, we, by just doing so much more, we naturally got better and we kind of then, you know, once you get to maybe 13 or 14 is when like professionalism kind of starts, or at least you get on the train to professionalism. It, it, college sports isn't really a thing in Europe. It's at 18, you can go pro. Um, so that's my, my brother and I did. Um, so around like 13 or 14 is when we kind of got on that, into that system um, and then just managed to progress through there. But it, it was, so it was always, a huge it was always a huge part of everything we did and and again even socially we would just go to games watch games or sitting down tv and watching games as a family my mom I, she wasn't a huge rugby fan but she kind of learned to be it seems pretty genuine she got interested in the sport um so yeah that that was it was it was always there and um like loved it wouldn't change a thing about that and as you went uh into that kind of pathway of development at 13 14 um, did it change for you or do you feel like you were able to sustain that those elements of connection and fun and what do you think? Yeah, um, the definitely was change. Probably like 16, 17 when I was very confident that I was going to, this was going to be an option for me to, to do professionally. Um, maybe a, um, a little bit of the enjoyment factor probably left because you're a little bit more focused on the performance side of things um and just because the amount of resources that have been pumped into you and everything you know is with the idea of performance in mind so i think personally i definitely um be, maybe lost a little bit of the enjoyment factor um around that just just because i think the stakes are higher and you're not really equipped to 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 fully interpret that and deal with that um so the connection element was still huge like don't get me wrong and like some of my best friends are from that time so so that was still very much part of the process but i think i think when you get into the professional ranks especially relatively young um a lot of this external stuff maybe that you're not as i said you're not fully equipped to deal with um can make you a little bit more stressful than you'd like it to be um but i will say the team i was with are very good in terms of sports psychologists providing providing those things but um, you are aware you're, in a, you're kind of entering a business and at the end of the day, your only currency is performance. Um, so that, that I probably became aware of that maybe like, you know, in the early stages of my professional career. Oh, yeah, yeah. And still like, so it's still enjoyable, you know, that intensity and the focus and you're mm -hmm. just honing, 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 but it's a different, different kind of fun, hey, or different joy. Um, what do you think would help when you talk about you weren't fully equipped? No kid is really coming into that. Is there a way to help that? Or is it just, you know, learn by fire, you dive in, you got to figure it out. I think um, maybe having been made aware or being kind of told a little bit more that like you're still very young and you're still very much in development and, and learning stage. Like we don't expect you to be perfect or um yeah. like it's it, it's okay it's okay to it's okay to make make those mistakes especially we're talking between 16 and 21 um whereas you do feel the need to be perfect because you do want to be playing in the first team um you do want to be getting a new contract bigger contract all those things and so you probably do put some pre pressure on yourself um so, so maybe just having a better understanding of that I, I think it's worth referencing as well that i would definitely find a person especially back then that would put, put, put pressure on myself and be a pretty harsh critic of myself. So, you know, it wasn't all from the team or whatever, like some of it was unnecessary probably and in hindsight that I could have been adding to it. Um, 
but yeah, something I actually coach quite a bit. Um, I used to coach a lot in rugby uh, the last year or so, not as much since I've transitioned sports, but uh, trying to make sure you really harp on like that enjoyment factor and then how it's, how it's a, you're in a learning environment, so we don't expect perfection and mistakes do happen and not to get too hung up on those things. And that's something that I tell myself now in the kind of football world, just because if you go chasing, chasing perfection, especially when there's so many uncontrollables around you, it's pretty hard to achieve that. And if, and if that's the only thing that's going to make you happy, well, you're not going to be very, very happy because you're not going to achieve that. So you know, understanding that and that definitely comes with age, I would say. Right on. Yeah. And that, yeah, that would be such, so helpful, I think, for young people coming into any sport, right? Just laying out a bit more of a long-term plan and setting goals that are relevant for their development so that they understand the concept of development, but also aren't kind of overshooting and then injuring or whatever. Because yeah, these mindsets, right? They will put all that pressure on themselves and it's not good for anybody. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thinking back to those times, right? You went to, is it Connaught Academy? Maybe tell us a bit about that. Yeah. That's different from what kids would experience in Canada. And um, and then through that, what you know, what are some key lessons you learned or how would you describe your development through those phases and what did each of those environments contribute to your learning what do you remember yeah um i guess essentially what it is is like you you become full-time you become like professional so you have your first team and then you have your like the academy which is usually age 17 to 21 like once you leave high school you become eligible to because you're getting paid not a whole lot but you know you're getting paid you're professional you, you, you're in a full-time environment um so I entered that at probably 18 when I left high school. Uh, absolutely loved it. Like, that was very much what I wanted to do, where I wanted to be, and was thrilled to be. You know, all of a sudden, you, you're, you're training, you're training so much to to kind of progress, and you know, now you've signed, now you've signed a professional contract. That's something you dream of, and all of a sudden, you get some money to do things you you do for free. You know, so like, so that was a really kind of I guess fun time. Um, that, yeah, that that I really enjoyed, and then you know, you, you're just learning like what it takes to be. So you, you really learn about nutrition. I went to a boarding school. Um, they're quite common in Ireland, uh, relatively common. So I went to a boarding school for two years. Um, so everything's kind of done for you. And then I left. When I left there and went into rugby, you are kind of pampered in terms of like you, you, you know, you you are taken care of. You don't. It's only only when I left that environment you realize that how much is actually done for you. <laughs> um, which at the time is great because they want to control as much of your recovery, nutrition side of things as possible. Um. But uh, back like back then, it's it's weird because you're trying to you're trying to focus so much on like building yourself up, and um, particularly physically because you're not you're not you're playing you're playing with big men who could be you know 34 who've been playing professionally for 15 years, or you know like highly athletic people. So I think at that time my biggest focus was like I was quite skinny fella, so just trying to like add size because it's absolutely necessary for you know to be going up against you know massive massive men and um, so i think that, that that was like my primary focus i remember that and then i'd say you're you're so focused on achieving that and achieving your career the academic side of things quite often becomes because you, a lot of guys enroll in university you're only 18 you know so you, you, you want to try and be in college but also chase this professional side of things um so it's quite a it's quite a difficult thing to do because all your mates are just in college and they're having a good time whereas you know, and they go out party and blah blah blah. Whereas, you know, you don't you you don't have that side of things. You you're not really living that lifestyle. You're not because you know they're not sustainable to be kind of doing both. So, it's something maybe I think to do a better job now is really encouraging guys to go after their academic side of things. And like you can do both. Whereas at the time, myself and a lot of the guys, it was like 2010. We were so convinced we're going to be superstars and earn. All the money in the world that we could just focus on this you know and you, you just you're just a bit naive to the other side of things and, and thankfully i eventually came around and got got into all of the education side of stuff but um yeah it was it was funny looking back now i haven't thought about it much but it was funny kind of where your where your headspace is at and again you're quite you're 18 so you can be quite immature you're, you're rubbing shoulders with guys who are really big names and you see them and their lifestyle and like you know what they're earning and the nice car they drive you're like oh that's gonna be me in a few weeks like, this is great so you, you're just kind of all you're just all there versus maybe the other side so the balance of my life wasn't great back then um was purely focused on the sporting side of things and it's something again that i, I you know i'm still kind of trying to figure out but 
back then I would have been hyper focused on just that small component of my life and not really aware of everything else going around around and you're, you're in a bubble in a bubble for sure as I would describe that time yeah and you wonder if you could force that right like if it's just a, a phase you have to go through as an 18 year old to just recognize that and maybe the coaches or the professionals around you supporting your development could be a little more cognizant of when you'd be ready to start hearing about education you know they give you a couple of years to live the dream and go for it and then and then just start nudging people toward education. I feel like there isn't, in Canada, there is increasingly less emphasis at all on the education part. So it's um, becoming a problem. But with something that like uh, college or, you know, yeah, the varsity sport, right? Or the college sport in the US, at least it's running in parallel. And you, you see that a yeah. lot. Some of, like, something like football is great. Most have their undergrad, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so what led you into education eventually? What kind of tweaked you to that need? I realized I wasn't going to be the superstar that mm -hmm. I thought I was, you know, like, like three years earlier and you're getting shoulder surgery. Oh. Um, so, you know, all, all those things. So I actually went on to play. I signed to play out in Italy. I moved there like 22-ish, I think 22, 23. But um, my shoulder, I had to get a shoulder reconstruction. So it was kind of then I realized, all right, you know, I, I need to... I need to go back to college. And fortunately, I got to go to uh, do a sports business degree in the US. I always wanted to go to the US for some reason. I don't know why, it just it was always just something I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, I was never afraid to pick up and travel, hence why I went to Italy actually. And I didn't speak Italian, but you figure it out. Um, a lot of hand gestures. But th then, yeah, around 22, 23, when I got the surgery, I, I went to study in the US. Again, I was never overly interested in the academic side of things. I just understood that well, it was probably necessary now as I'm getting a little bit older. Turned out, absolutely loved it. I like, really enjoyed it and then went on to do my master's, master's degree. And, like, I would never would have thought I would bother doing a master's degree. Mm -hmm. I'm not delighted I have. But I, you know, again, I was just in a different place. You're older, you're more mature, you, you, you understand the importance of it. And that's what I'm a big advocate or preacher of when I coach or different people reach out to me asking questions or advice, whatever that may be like really respect and respect go out like you can do both you can chase the athletic side of things and still maintain your academic side like academic stuff whereas I didn't recognize that at the time but uh yeah so that's it was around 22 when I understood that I needed to study and then that took me to the US um and yeah I loved it and I was highly interested in the business of sport I knew it was a business degree with some kind of sport management components and yeah I just found that really really interesting to be honest and Back in Ireland, it wasn't really offered. So um, yeah, that's why I was quite willing to, to jump over to Missouri, which I'd never even heard of, but I ended up <laughs> studying that for a yeah. while. Tell us about that, the program, the college, and you played rugby while you were attending. Yeah, and how, how did you balance that? Uh, so it's called Lindawood University um, outside, a uh, little bit like an hour outside St. Louis. Um, I went there on a rugby scholarship because recovering from the shoulder injury. Uh, unfortunately, when I got there, I was deemed ineligible to play because oh. of my professional back, my professional background. So that was a whole thing that wasn't anticipated. But thankfully, my scholarship was kind of worded as academic. So I just had to maintain a decent GPA. So I got to stay, which, which was handy. Uh, yeah, that worked out really well. And that's when I started coaching because I couldn't play. So now I had the opportunity. I was like, what am I going to do now? And I ended up coaching. I ended up becoming, actually, I ended up becoming a sports agent at that time as well because I realized uh, in America, there's a lot of talent, America, Canada, a lot of talented athletes but they don't, in rugby, but they don't have the connections to the professional game in Europe. So I kind of had those connections. So I ended up getting to do that for like a year, which was a lot of fun. Um, really interested, learned a lot. Um but yeah, so, so that was over the course of like three years before I eventually returned to professional rugby myself because um, America and Canada started a league called Major League Rugby. Right. So I ended up jumping, in, jumping into that as a player for a few years. But yeah, that was kind of my, my time in Missouri. Yeah, I, and I just, again, just knowing that I'm highly interested in sports and was always curious about like, even when I was 18, 19, I wasn't that interested in the academic side of things, but I was interested in like the like the organization, how did that work? And you meet someone they become friends with in the office, they work in the front office in marketing or ticketing or whatever commercial side of stuff. Like I was interested in that. I just never, never really knew how to kind of combine the two. Um, 
And then that's what that's when I found the sports business to be it's like, oh, this I feel I feel like I could do something in this realm whenever the time comes for me to hang up my boots. So that, that yeah, that's kind of how I went about that. And then the course load definitely allowed me to kind of confirm what I what I, what I'm quite interested in, I guess. So that's how I would put that. And it's interesting because I'm hearing that connection theme keep it keeps popping up. So even as you start exploring the business side of sport you twigged into, you mentioned right away that idea of connecting, right? Making relationships, you as an agent, helping others connect to these opportunities and you're brilliant. What else do you think the business side of sport could learn or do better or, you know, develop somehow? That's kind of, kind um, of a left field. I didn't prepare you for that one, but. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, so I guess I'm, my perspective, is still pretty much, I guess, just from the athlete, from the, the player, you know, the player side of things for the most part. I was quite fortunate when I moved to play Major League Rugby, I joined an expansion team. And as when I joined the team, they did give me uh, a little bit more, they gave me a lot more scope than most players would get. Um, you know, so I got to kind of help out maybe some of the recruitment or offer an opinion, uh, organizationally how things work. So I, I actually did. And from that, what I learned is that when organizations really try to these are new expansion teams so i can't i get it but um try to cut corners and um cost i get i get cost saving but they they retracted a lot from the player experience trying to save as much money as possible and then as a result compared to other teams and as a result the player there wasn't as much like buying and a commitment to the team and the organization um, this is like three years ago since the team has recognized the error in their ways and totally revamped how they allocate their spending. And they're just after going out and they're, they're currently the most successful team in the league now. And I was chatting to the, I was chatting to the lads about it. And I was like, so what's changed from when I played? Because I've, I've been gone. And literally they talk about just like, you know, how they feel like they're, they feel like they're valued as individuals. They're not just commodities that can be trained, uh, traded or chopped at any point. Um, which is, is not that shocking to me, you know. If you, it, it's easy to get attached and want to do your best for for an, a team, organization, a city, when you know you genu you feel like you're more than just a kind of a body that's there to be disregard, like just banged up and abused <laughs> in terms of what we can do to you, and then you're just chopped and gotten rid of very quickly. So it's interesting when they when they stopped when they stopped doing that and showed more loyalty and commitment to people and you know they, them and their families and trying to help that you know they move to a new city and really feel part of it results on the pitch change dramatically so i think that's something that i think in football what i'm learning so far maybe isn't necessarily the case in terms of it's it can be you get chopped and traded pretty quickly from, from what, how i'm understanding but from what i saw in rugby it was just yeah they really invested in the people that you know that are that are your product essentially um like really respecting them and how they're treated had huge it just huge ripple effects across the organization. So that was, yeah, that's something I've kind of seen firsthand over the last, say, three years. And it's tough because people are reluctant to invest, right, with they don't see a return immediately. But once they recognize that, okay, investing in this is going to be in relationship and engagement and collaboration and not just to pander, right, to the, the athletes, but to actually engage them as part of a partnership model. Love it. Mm. Awesome. And then, so you played major league rugby and how's that, how is that league going? How's it, how's it developing? Do you think in the U S? Yeah, I think it started in 2018. Um, and I think it was five teams initially. So maybe it was five, it was quite small. Um, I was playing out in San Diego and it was, it was really cool to be part. We called everyone was pioneers and everyone enjoyed the idea of being a pioneer and, you know, we're creating the culture we're creating traditions that are that you're going to be hopefully around long after we're done so that was quite fun um because you know most sports teams whatever you enter there is a tradition in history so you're just kind of picking that up whereas you know we were the ones forging that um so that, that yeah that added to a really interesting new dynamic and the teams that really got behind that and got there behind the idea of creating their own internal kind of the, the culture but then traditions that were started there they tended to do better because you know the players are so highly involved in that um we drove it so as a result of that you know go back to that engagement factor um that you know was at an all-time high whereas the organizations that just didn't really kind of tap into that 
the players, you know, they weren't actually they weren't as bought in because they weren't asked to really kind of go away and think about like, you know, who do we want to be as a team? How do we want to be viewed as people? Uh, or something like our team song, like what's our team song going to look like? Just like, or what do we do after the game? We win. Just little traditions that um, we never had to think about before because, as I said, you just picked up what had gone before you. So that was that was really interesting and fun. Um, something really unique. So yeah, that that was in 2018, and then fast forward to current day. I think there's now like 12 or 13 teams. Um, some major players around the world are, 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 are choosing to come play in the league. Um, Toronto, Canada is now a team in Toronto. So now it's, you know, it's North and South America. Um, yeah, from, from now, it's interesting what, from considering I was so highly involved for three years now, kind of watching from the outside, it was, um, it's, it's, it's interesting to watch, but it seems like it's going from strength to strength. And same as Anthony, it just in sports, it just takes, I guess, business people who are willing to you know not see a reward uh, return investment for quite a while but like really trust in the sport and the product what it is and then a big part of that has been like the community outreach side of things like getting into the communities creating awareness of who the team and the players are but also you know like helping to grow the sport and especially rugby is an untraditional sport that you know you're getting out to I coached well over a thousand people when I was when I was with the team. We did so much high school and college community community outreach stuff and just meeting programs from all over New England. Um, yeah, really enjoyable. So I think the t- I think most teams are doing that. I think you know if you're really building a good solid foundation uh, within the community, that's you know that's going to prop up the organization and hopefully you know they they go to games and this they start bringing the friends to games and this is kind of more kids are playing so the parents come to the games and have more like kind of a growth like that versus um i think there's a nice organic way to grow versus maybe just throwing a load of money at it which i think a league tried to do a rugby league tried to do that like in 2010 2012 but it collapsed pretty quickly because there was no there was no there was no sense of community that connection aspect didn't exist so you know a guy lost a lot of money and the league disappeared whereas now this league looks like it's in a really good spot and I think it's the community side of things that, that is, yeah, is, is absolutely essential and critical. And it's cool to see it's actually working. I went to, I haven't been to a game in a few years, but I went to a game at the weekend because um, I'm here in Boston. And I saw, you know, a lot of people that I saw that said, oh, you coach me back in, you know, whatever, or we crossed paths back then, or just meeting families and stuff. So it was really cool to see, you know, I think maybe three, 4,000, nothing major, but it's, you know, it's a decent starting point, I would say. I love it. Yeah. And that's that Toronto Arrows team, right? I know we have a couple of kids mm-hmm. from Victoria here at playing right on. And that system vision, right? That it's part of a, there's your theme again of community and connection. I love it. And of course, we learn that from sport, the power of, you know, relying on your teammates and being part of something bigger than yourself. And what do you think rugby has to offer the world? Like as a, I always think it's, I always think in terms of education, you know, but what do we learn? I listen to people. I'm a total fan of rugby and always have been, but I hear friends of mine who don't know rugby and they experience it for the first time going to the sevens tournament or something and locally. And it's just mind blowing for them and, and life changing. What do you think it is about rugby that, that uh, captivates people? Oh, what, what I love the most about, about it is like, you can go, and I've experienced this anywhere in the world. And if you say, you know, you say you play rugby, there's instantly a community, whether it's in the Philippines, where I was recently, or Spain, some non-traditional companies, for example, that, and I tell people I play rugby, and instantly there's a rugby club, there's people there that want to, you know, meet and say hello, and just like so accept, accepting, welcoming. And um, like I remember, specifically in the Philippines, I was shocked. I was like, oh, wow, there was like, a, there was a rugby, kind of an underground rugby community, but I think once you mention that word that, that you play the game, no matter where you are, people like people are just the like, rugby community is just so welcoming and accepting. Like it, and that's what I find for people that haven't played the sport when they enter, they're always shocked. They're like, "Oh wow, everyone's just so nice and allowed me in and just treated me as the best mate pretty quickly." There wasn't this kind of guarded, standoffish approach, or it was very much like our for those that are of age, it's very much oh, have a beer and you have a beer and you drink and you're socializing and like. It's yeah. I, I just found like that's definitely unique. I, I I'm very confident that's unique because other sports I've been involved in or made so involved in other sports. I that kind of camaraderie, that that social side of things, is yeah. I I would say it's unique to rugby. So I'm not surprised that when you say you know people come to an event, they it, it, you just get gripped to it because again, if everyone's so nice, you're like, well, these are a lot of nice people that are being nice to me and they're 
they're good fun and they're just nice respect good and respectful people kind of why wouldn't you want to associate yourself with that so yeah that that's and it's a global passport as i tell people if you play rugby no matter where as i said no matter where you go in the world you're, you're going to meet a community of people um that that are just we're all very similar even if you don't speak the language you can just throw a ball and we're just smiling we're like i didn't the filipino kids you know they didn't fully or i don't understand you know there's language barriers but we still laughed and joked and you know throwing the ball around for 30 minutes to an hour and just playing games it was the the language barrier didn't really matter just like just the ball like the ball just acted as a way of communicating i guess um so it's quite fun oh i love that i love the global passport and the ball as your as your kind of conduit of communication so cool yeah and it is so so much fun and what do you think what what aspect of that do you think is embedded in kind of the principles or the rules of rugby too like you go to a sevens tournament everybody's dressing up these communities like you say they pop out of nowhere like who knew how many Fijians lived in Vancouver <laughs> <laughs> and it's so great in Samoa and so they did so well at the last tournament and um what do you think is embedded in rugby because it's like part of the part of the cultural um principles of the sport too hey? yeah I think it, I think it's easy you know you see people or different organizations and I've seen it in other sports or even business in general, and like a really common word that's thrown around like is respect. But I remember from the literally the age of six, the, the respect element of the referee, of your, your coaches that you're working with, of other players, you know, again, from the age of six, I've never walked off a rugby pitch where I haven't shaken the hands of every other player I've played against. And then we clapped them off in a tunnel as they then exit the field and they do vice versa. Um, I often captain teams, you, you know, you go to find the referee after the game and say, thank you. And the touch show to say thank you, um, I, like that's that's unique. So I think that respect element, whether it's in an amateur is an amateur level of the game, I think all the way through the professionalism, like that was that isn't lost. Um, like that 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 remains intact, and everyone in the world that have gone actually. So so I think people throw around the word our oh, rugby's. What is it? I know it, it was a gentleman's game played by hooligans. <laughs> a hooligans, uh, no, a hooligan, a hooligans game played by gentlemen. Uh, I think I do often hear that and I was like fantastic male and females that play that play the sport around the world. And yeah, like that respect element is is really embedded, but it, it's it's actually you see it. It's not just a word that's a buzzword that's thrown around, but it's you know, and if someone does act up, act up meaning be quite disrespectful, they're usually you know, they're called out pretty quickly, whether it's their other like their teammates saying, Hey, we don't do that, or whether it's more formal to a referee and you get you get in trouble and then you kind of realize you were wrong um other sports i've seen there's a lot more kind of negative chat going on or conversations going on that i don't think you we don't really have it doesn't really exist in rugby um so that, that's yeah quite a unique thing that we, we can be very proud of as a as a sport yeah and maybe because it is so hard <laughs> and so everybody has that appreciation for the ref too i mean god they're sprinting around like crazy and and get caught up in the thick of it sometimes. Amazing. Now, transferring into or transitioning into another sport, into football, maybe just talk a bit, because I know your background, but you could talk for people who are uh, going to be listening in. What, what is your role and how, why are you being picked up by a CFL team now? Yeah, um, maybe a year ago, year and a half ago, I decided to try and play football as a kicker and punter. Um, never really watched sports obviously didn't play in college didn't I had no background in the sport in, in Ireland I'm the only Irish guy that's yeah. like born and raised Irish guy you know up in Canada um so yeah like a year and a half ago I decided to give it a go with an absolutely no promises being told is highly unlikely actually because I was 28 I was 29 I'm now 30 so I've been told the odds of success are highly unlikely but I was so curious to, to, to give it a go and try try something fresh and something new. So that, yeah, that's I, and from there that's I played I played my first ever game in like May of last year, and then I played there in Indiana, Indianapolis and then joined because uh, everyone's judged off their college career and I couldn't play in college. I was kind of like, oh, look, where, what do I do? Where do I play? Unfortunately, a European league started up between Spain, Germany, and Poland. Um, so I found myself playing there for like six, eight weeks, uh, living in Poland and playing like, you know, in Germany or Spain every other weekend, playing American football, which is quite random. But uh, yeah, I did that. And then most recently signed with the Hamilton Tiger Cats for the upcoming season. So that's 
debrief version of it all. But yeah, that's that's how I found myself to the to the sport. And so far, I'm really enjoying it. I'm, I'm just enjoying something new. Um, I'm just enjoying something new because I love rugby, but I knew that if I if I didn't try this now, you know, the door would probably never open up again. And I often tell myself, imagine telling 10 year old Tig that you go on to play like play professional rugby and achieve some cool things and then all of a sudden pivot to a career because I loved kicking as a kid loved kick I go kicking on Christmas day I would just go kicking I get rugby ball soccer would just go kicking so to tell tell him that you know when he's 30 he'd be moving to a new sport where literally all you do is kick um, I know I'd be thrilled and over the moon with it so I keep reminding myself of that just trying to keep that enjoyment factor and not to take any of it for granted I guess yeah, and tell us about the kicking. What have you kind of noticed between rugby and football, the different approaches to kicking and what you think you can offer? Yeah, um, the, the hardest thing was just understanding, you know, in rugby you're so involved in the game in so many capacities. And now I, now I just sit down and drink water and you kick for like 1.2 seconds and you sit, you sit, you sit down to get um over the course of whatever three hours so that was probably the hardest um transition and I, i'm still ongoing i've only played like 10 games so i'm by no means an expert here um but yeah so that was probably the hardest bit to understand um in terms of on the field and the act of kicking like in rugby you control everything in terms of you know you, you know in terms of putting the ball on the tee getting out aligned with your goalposts and you're going to your breathing routines going through everything you know you, you have like 60 seconds of complete control whereas in football that doesn't exist because you know you're relying on a snapper you're relying on a holder to put the ball down to like you know do it exactly how you like it and you got to get all that done in like 1.2 to 1.3 seconds so like that's that's been that you know all of a sudden i'm approaching a ball that isn't there and then boom it arrives like last second i kick it whereas you know again rugby i you know it controlled everything and i could see the ball so all those things helped. Um, so it's been a challenge, but obviously doing well enough that I've been signed. So that, that's positive. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how it goes. You know, we think we start camp hopefully in a week or so. But uh, yeah, that, that's, there's some of the, the most obvious and glaring um, adjustments I've had to make. And different kinds of kicking in rugby. So what do you think you're, you know, I think you and I, you and I, I think had that conversation about you know what you know about kicking and how you approach kicking and the skill involved and and what do you think you're going to be able to kind of add to Hamilton for yeah. sure yeah I think the league in general people yeah in, people yeah because we have to do quite in rugby it's very dynamic and it's on the move and uh especially when you're kicking on your hand in the in the act of the game um yeah, there's a, there's a lot of moving parts in your, you also have multiple options, whether you do kick, do you pass, do you run? Whereas in football, I guess you can kick, pass and run in football as well, but I don't think my job is going to be to pass the ball a whole lot. <laughs> and I'm going to be just kicking it. So what I found is in, in rugby, we have a lot more like different types of swings and different types of kicks we can use and different ways we use our body and, and the plane and angles of our leg. Whereas in football, it's a lot more traditional and it's, it's done a certain way. And they want you to do it that way. Um, so I can't say I love that. I, I, I like I like the idea that if you can achieve an outcome, but maybe be slightly new, untraditional, unique in how you how you do it. Um, I you know that, I think that could be quite positive as well. I, I, alongside, you still have to achieve the outcome. I mean, it doesn't if you, you can't look and do things oddly strange, but you know not achieve the outcome. So uh, I found picking in football has been a lot more traditional than I would have expected in, in how they want you to look and how they want your mechanics to be. Um, so I've been trying to fight the battle of adapting to that, but also my 20 years of muscle memory kicking a rugby ball is quite different, you know, so trying to like adjust that as well has been quite difficult. Um, so I'm trying to find a, a hybrid. Uh, so yeah, that's, I hope that kind of answers your question, but it, it's, it's different. So I hope to be able in the CFL to be given the scope to, to kind of embrace that um uniqueness of my journey and my background and you know it, it can be a competitive advantage I'm, I'm very confident of that well i was just listening to i guess the draft is happening today but i was listening to a couple of guys commentating and and thinking and reflecting on a couple of the rule changes and you wonder right like if you'll have if there may be an opportunity to to approach things a little bit differently and uh borrow a bit from rugby 
anyway, we'll see. I know there have been, you know, clips of games, both in NFL and CFL, where the guys start just passing the ball around, right? Mm -hmm. In the middle of a game, mm -hmm. which is pretty unusual, usually, you know, pass, receive, and touchdown, but cool to see. Awesome. And um, maybe talk a bit about, yeah, what else did I want to ask you about? Oh, yeah, the leadership. So you've often, when I look back over your career, you you tend to find yourself in leadership roles of some sort. <laughs> and what do you think that's about? What do you think your strengths are or what you're bringing? And and part two of that question is, what do you what do you think the role or what is leadership on a sports team look like? What's been effective, effective model? Like some teams go with a leadership team of players and others have the captain model. And so first of all, your leadership. And then what do you think that leadership model looks like in sport? Yeah. Um I never planned on it. So I think I never like planned or saw myself. My surname is Leader, but that's about the only connection I saw at the time. Um, and I think when you're like, the, 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 it probably started in terms of being captain of teams. So primarily hurling is an Irish sport, creative football is an Irish sport, and then rugby. And from the age of like 15 onwards, I'd always be, I'd, I'd always be kind of captain you generally captain of at least one of those teams, if not multiple teams. And I don't think it was because I was a great leader. I think back then when you're that young, it's just, you're, you're just good. You're just, to be honest, I think I was just a very good player in all those sports. Um, yeah. That's honestly, I think at least for how I remember it, because I, I wouldn't have been a, a crazy a vocal player. Um, so I think being good at the sport and kind of leading by doing, and naturally again, at that age, lads would respect you because you know if you usually the, if usually the main player you just kind of naturally have that respect so i'd say that's how it initially started i don't think i was giving any amazing speech i mean at 15 how much can you be doing anyway <laughs> um or at least yeah, so uh, but anyway it, it started with that um and then as i got older generally i was quite um analytical because in rugby my position would be uh, fly half number 10 so i was quite in football quite similar to the quarterback so I think I was always had to be like a student of the game. That was a big part of it. The fly half is generally like almost an extension of the coach. You know, you're calling on the plays and you're dictating how things operate on the field. So naturally you have to be a relatively smart fella to interpret that and understand how to get that onto the field. So you're delivering messaging all the time, but you're calling the plays all the time. So that I guess like that was, I'd say my leadership, why I progressed in leadership roles was, yeah, because I understood the sport, understood the tactics side of things. And probably the biggest asset would be like remaining composed. Like I'm not, I, I'm very seldom shouting and screaming or get like really emotive. Like this. So that works for some players. Maybe some of the bigger lads are just got to run into a wall all the time. That might help them, but that's not my job. So I, I guess I re remain pretty calm and understood what it is we're trying to achieve and how to achieve that. So that, that would be like my, my leadership style. And then yeah, that's that's what I'd say it, it goes for me. It's something that at times I wasn't very comfortable because you always feel the need to be saying something or be like motivational. So what I learned is you kind of referenced it earlier and rugby is quite good for having, you have a captain, um, but then we have like a leadership group, which could be another three to five players. So you can lean on them at different times because I think you can get stale get given the same message. And for the lads, like you wouldn't react, you, know, you can't always get a reaction if you're hearing the same thing for the same person in the same tone. Um, so having different people affording them a platform to, to chat and say things, and for me, it was really good. Then I could lean on them, where it'd be like, "Hey, like at the end of training today, like can you can you just pipe up and say something here?" It, you know, because I, you know, generally at the end, I was always saying something, and like, like there comes a point there's only so much you can say, especially over a long season, you get repetitive. Um, so yeah, I think from, in rugby it's really it's really good at, at, at uh, having leadership groups. And then what I really like about rugby, and I'm not sure how prevalent this would be in football, is how willing the coaches are to listen to us. And like every Monday morning, we'd have a leadership group meeting, leadership uh, meeting with the coaching staff, and decide what our week's going to look like. Um, whether there's any cultural stuff to address or any themes that we need to try and install, whatever it may be, it was a lot of synergy like a lot of synergy, whereas I found in football, it doesn't seem to be the case as much um, for whatever reason. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure yet. Hopefully I'll be able to answer that question better once I 
experience what I'm, what's, what's coming ahead. But yeah, th- that's a huge bonus, I think, to the leadership, how collaborative it is. And there's genuine respect from the coach to the players and vice versa. Um, not to say that's not in football, but they, they're very open and receptive to what, because they trust, you know, you guys on the pitch doing it. The leadership group lads are generally somewhat intelligent and can articulate or decipher what's happening and then present a message or give a message. So they're very open to, like, you know, we'd be huge say in, in, what, in what a training week looks like or what a season looks like um, and in turn culture looks like. So yeah, that, that, that's, that's, a huge, that's a huge positive, I would say, of rugby. Yeah, and football certainly has that reputation and kind of tradition of a real military background. I mean, the whole concept of a gridiron and and it being very command and control. But you wonder, I get the sense working and listening to the guys that were in the course that some teams are truly evolving to more of that partnership model and having a leadership team and it's coming along. So it would be it would be good. I do think it is an evolutionary path for any group, right, where you you do need that structure to begin with, but then to move to a place where you're yeah. more yeah, independent. Tell me about more about composure and why, how you, how you achieve it. You know, why do you think, where does that come from? Why is it important? Uh, why do you think you, I mean, it's personality for sure, but clearly it's something you have honed and fostered and what role does it play in leadership? I, I, I think I, say all my family be relatively composed when I say that I have a younger brother he's he's actually coaching rugby at Clemson now and I actually I wouldn't describe him as composed so uh yeah I I guess yeah like that's always just been within sport the kind of the expectation of like the position that I play is to be the one that people can look to and you have an answer and the answer you know you know for for what's about for what's about to happen next or a solution to what's occurring um and, you know, I don't react, I don't find an answer if I'm highly emotional, you know, and, and like my head's in, or you know, you're just seeing red. Um, yeah, so so I don't think it was a very, a very conscious thing, Init- at least initially, I think that, that was just, maybe I just knew that came with the territory of my, my position. I used to watch so many games and usually the, the, the guy that wore my number and had my job usually looked quite composed. Um, generally were the kickers as well, so as a kicker within rugby, you, you, like all of a sudden you're playing this really highly competitive dynamic game. And then all of a sudden, a, you know, it comes a kick and the whole game stops. It's like, and it's like someone's playing golf for the next 90 seconds. The stadium goes quiet, all eyes are on you and you have to be relatively zen to kind of manage all of that. Um, so I guess it, for me, it just kind of came with the position. And then that was from watching others on TV. That, that definitely influenced the people that I probably would have looked up to were generally more softly spoken I would say or you know they, yeah again not the rah-rah kind of guys and um, not the guys you see shouting in the spit and their blood coming off the right now like that wasn't that wasn't the expectation um so I think that's where it stemmed that's where that stemmed from um yeah sorry I, I there's a second part to that question so I'm just I was thinking so much on where did that start uh, I forgot the second part of the question. It's fine I, it struck me it's all right to go all over I was thinking about a couple of things like being composed really gives is about confidence and in exuding that with the guys as well like it'll be okay and have you ever not had the answer have you ever felt oh yeah yeah what happened yeah 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 um we remember playing actually against toronto i remember playing a game against toronto and it was our first ever game so we're an expansion team we're still very much figuring out our taking out the roster um and so our player our playing base wasn't wasn't great um and we lost by like 30 40 points so like considerable loss big loss i just you know usually when you can see the when you can see a score you kind of gather under the sticks and you're under the goalposts and you you, you know the captain speaks but i remember after conceding like a fifth or sixth try or seven seven try i remember just kind of looking at one of the boys and was like can you say something <laughs> because like, <laughs> I'm, I, I, I'm i don't have an answer here like we're just we're just getting hammered um, you know, there's only so many times you can try and be like, all right, look, next job, next focus, we're going to do this, we're going to apply pressure here, and we're going to get an opportunity or keep the energy up, blah, blah, blah. Eventually, it was just like, all right, I think we all know what's happening. The sink, the sink is, uh, the sink, the, the ship is sinking. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that would definitely be a time where I just, I just didn't have, just didn't have anything to, 
an, an answer. And I also think um, when I started, when I left professional rugby to be a student, and then when I came back into it, I had been detached from it for like four years, but I was still I was still a member of the leadership group because I wasn't a captain, but I was a member of the leadership group. I just based, I was in America in San Diego, but based on my, my previous playing history um, and my position as well, you expect a bit of a leader, but I remember not being overly comfortable in that leadership group because I was around guys who had been more accomplished than me, but also they were, the three or four years I was a student, they were still playing extremely high level around the world. So I felt a bit detached from like the current trends or expectations within the game, just because mm-hmm. I wasn't part of it anymore. So I do remember in those meetings, not really, not really having a lot to say and thinking, should I be saying more than also being aware that like, I struggle, to be honest, I struggle when people just always feel the need to speak, to hear their voice and like how effective is that? So I didn't want to be one of those people. So as a result, I, I probably went the other side where I didn't even talk enough. Um, fun enough, I ended up becoming captain of that team later in the season um, due to different circumstances. And I, I kind of found my voice a bit more then. But yeah, that was a time. That was an example of time as well, where I just wasn't super confident around, around what I was bringing to the table. So I um, probably went. I said didn't want to over, didn't want to speak for the sake of being heard, but maybe went too far the other way and just almost was saying very, very little. And I'm thinking about in both situations where you know, oh my God, the fifth, sixth, seventh try. You almost have to just let the game run out and then let's revisit. So what did your team, what did you and the team kind of shift after that experience with Toronto? Um, almost the short answer is almost everyone that was on the team, bar like myself and four others actually were <laughs> remained on the team. <laughs> so there, was, there wasn't a whole lot to, uh, <laughs> to yeah, it was just, Reset. it was just white. Yeah, it was very much white. Yeah, it was very much white. <laughs> yeah, but that was a strange, that's not normal. That was a strange scenario because I said, we're, we're an expansion team. So before bringing in all of foreign players and different players from around America, they tried to find the best local players to, and then supplement it with a few guys like myself to see were the local guys good enough and found out no was the answer. So yeah, so, so that wasn't a normal situation, but that's what happened there. That's so funny. Awesome. And last question is really about hearkening back to a couple of comments you made about other people you were watching. You know, who were those icons and mentors, people, the number 10s you were watching on the screen and kind of modeling after? What impressed you about them? What were you sort of taking from them? Of course, you can't be them, but there are things I'm sure you would try to emulate. Yeah. Um... There's a guy, his name's Johnny Wilkinson. He um, won a World Cup in England in 2003, and he, he was just like the world's best kicker. Still probably is the best kicker of all time. And my biggest passion in rugby was kicking. So I always looked to him um, as to what he was doing and how he was doing it, what he was saying uh, as like, you know, a, a, a major mentor. And he is really interesting because I found out since is that like he was going through massive, internal um I think he, depression um yeah he was the best player in the world yet he like had the most pressure on his shoulders he kicked the drop goal in the world cup final the last play of the game to win it yeah so like you know phenomenal um yeah he had like a huge and in, like internal turmoil going on like identity crisis and stuff like that but it was really interesting to he, he talks about that openly now but back then um i guess he didn't uh, but he was a person though just in terms of how he performed I looked up to but then he always had that kind of compo- external composure but then as it turns out internally he obviously had a lot of things going on but but he was just the best kicker of all time so I guess I, I, I would always look to him um, but it's, yeah, it's really interesting now to hear him talk about talk about what he was dealing with and I don't think the resources or people were as, as willing or open to hear the hearing these hearing that you know maybe that like you're the best player in the world it's like what do you have to be sad about or what you know Whereas I think now there's a lot more of an understanding that, um, but he talks about a lot of pressure, external pressure, and put, makes, putting pressure on him. So even when I listen to his stuff, or he makes some really good points um, around things that maybe I might feel or I'm dealing with. So it's quite helpful. Uh, so yeah, there wasn't a whole lot of people I looked up to. Uh, one other guy, but like in Ireland, Ireland's so tiny. I, I'll go kicking on Christmas Day, and he'd also be there. So it's quite funny, you know, like your your idols are. It's not like America, you know, 
or maybe even Canada, you know, where super, they're superstars. Like it's not really, that's, you know, it's not really the case for us in Ireland. It's a pretty small and local place. Um, so John Wilkes is the only guy that I think when it comes to mind that I have major respect for and admiration for. Lovely. You know, that's so interesting. I was doing my doctorate and I used that clip of him kicking that goal. Yeah, that feels like yeah. 2003 in a course I was doing just to illustrate, you know, poise. And I didn't know that background. So I'm going to look him up. But I think sometimes, too, when you're going through crisis, it almost hones you in and focuses you. But at such a cost, like we see that with Phelps and Claire Hughes, you know, all these amazing athletes, but going through such strife. So in some ways it contributes, but it's not a great way to contribute, is it? <laughs> we need to support no. our people. Cool. And finally, um, yeah, what are your goals going forward? What are you focusing on heading to Hamilton? <laughs> I'm just laughing yeah. because, you know, Hamilton has a bit of a reputation. So I'm, I can't wait to hear what you think of it as a town. <laughs> yeah, I've heard a lot of things about it, but I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, it, it's it's just funny because it, everything is just so new. You know, I spent the last few months training training in the south of Spain, where I had American football, and people like were looking at you like, "What is that? It's a weird shape. That's a weird shape, shape soccer ball." Um, and then being back in Ireland, where it's not too dissimilar. So I I've, I've had like an untraditional approach, I guess you could say, or extremely untraditional approach. Of course, I have. Um, so now I'm just trying to. I go, I think I go up there in like two or three days and I don't know what to expect, but I'm just kind of, I've already, I've already really proud of what I've achieved to try to like find a way, find a way into the sport considering where I've come from um, and the opportunity. So I'm just, I'm not putting a crazy amount of pressure on myself. I think if it was in rugby, you know, I'd feel comfortable and established. Um, I still obviously want to perform, et cetera, all, all those things, but I, I'm very much just trying to tell myself really and just enjoy enjoy each day for like enjoy each day that I want to get doing do, doing this and I'm loving the idea of being a pioneer already. Loads of people in Ireland have reached out and like they're asking for advice or they're like they would love to do it. So it's been cool to yeah. kind of fly that flag a little bit and um, potentially offer you know support or because my biggest problem was I had no uh, path to follow like there was because no one had done it so I didn't know which way to turn. I had to figure it out for myself. So now I've kind of paved a bit of a path. Uh, I definitely paved a bit of a path. So hopefully the others can go down that. So anyway, I'm, I'm already, I'm very proud and, and ex excited about what's happened so far, but in terms of excited what's to come, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm unique because I'm kicking and punting. Most guys only do one, um, but team are allowing me at least the opportunity to compete as both a kicker and punter. Awesome. So as a result, it means from a training perspective, it's been hard because I need to kind of practice two disciplines. Um, but from rugby, I'm used to doing both. So I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm maintaining that until I'm told, hey, you need, you need to make a decision here. Um, so yeah, for me, I've just been trying to do both as best I can. And then but just, just excited by the, the prospect of the unknown. Like just, 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 just going to react with, to what happens. Um, but yeah, it, it is weird not really knowing what, what's going to happen, considering I've always felt a good sense of control and understanding around what's coming. Um, whereas now I have no sense of what's coming. So I'm just going to like really enjoy that and learn as much as, as possible from the whole experience. Well, we talked a lot about core, you know, and yours is strong. And I'm sure that's uh, exactly what you can rely on as you, you head in. And I'm sure you'll make great connections with your long snapper and your holder. <laughs> Learning so much about that little trio team. I just love that. Uh, huge. And now you've connected to some other guys already across the league. So uh, it should be really exciting. We'll be cheering you on and, and watching your new forging of your new path with great interest. So thanks so much, Tig, and all the best. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks very much.